Hello! Welcome to Marco Bundy Journal Club, where we, did, we not out big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I dropped out for my PhD in microbiology. Uh, then I was a fact checker and editor for pharmaceutical advertisers, and nowadays I'm a member and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC dedicated to aim the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and I have a PhD in microbiology. I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also worked as a research integrity specialist, and I now work for a scientific journal. Uh, every other week we meet to talk about microbiology, and on a typical day like today, we do an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen in the last two weeks. <clears throat> yes, and we want to hear from you because at, uh, at some point we'll be selecting a specific paper to do a real deep dive into, so make sure you message us at microtwjc if something has caught your fancy. Yep, you can follow along with uh, the papers that we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library. Uh, our social media handles and the link to the library are in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Uh, firstly, we've got uh, stories about boosters. I, what, what's, what's coming out and will it be, I mean, how much are they going to protect us against the new Omicron strains? Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a couple of stories on that. What other things we do, do we have? We have uh, some stories about potential but monkeypox treatments and also uh, giant, giant viruses and how they get into battle with endosymbionts sometimes. And finally, we've got um, bacteria that divide in a weird way. And and uh, wildfires. Wildfires, what do they, what, what is up with them? Um, <laughs> what's the microbiology so, of wildfires, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, what's the microbiology of wildfires? How do, do things recover from it? What what happens after a wildfire? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but for first off, we wanted to talk about these Omicron-specific boosters that are getting approved. And so... Uh, to talk about them, we have um, we have the FDA uh, approval letters um, for for these specific um, drugs, and like their updates. So like I guess when the vaccines got approved, they got approved through some emergency use authorization style thing. So like these letters are like the same letters that were used to approve them way back when. Every time something new has happened, the letters have been updated with the new reasoning as to why. Uh, this drug is okay to give and what the benefits are, um, Yeah, why the FDA is allowing uh, it to go and be administered throughout the population. And so the, we have two letters, one from Moderna, one from Pfizer, and then Moderna has uh, a preprint about the vaccine that they're giving out, but Pfizer didn't, and it only has like um, uh, like a presentation that was given to the to the FDA. And so like we'll we'll go over some of the things that we saw in both of these uh in these documents <clears throat> right so first up shall we do the moderna yeah let's talk about the moderna vaccine so mr like they're both these are both the mrnas that are that are coming out as boosters um this was like i guess what was predict this is what people talked about when they were excited about the new technology of mrna vaccines <laughs> the idea that you could rapidly create a variant vaccine just because you just have to change the mrna and then hopefully get some uh, preliminary data for that and then go through the authorization process. So uh, they're using, so this letter specifically talks about using um, like a BA1 version of the mRNA, of the spike protein uh, is being put into this mRNA packaging, their liposomal packaging, whatever secrets, trade secret object, uh, and then being delivered to individuals. And then they're looking at, um, I think they want to look at I don't think they end up looking at who gets COVID after or before. They're just looking at um, antibodies as a correlate to immunity in, in both of these instances. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so yeah, this one is on. So let's see what because they don't because this is kind of just a lot of this paper is describing all the previous studies that can't come before. So I'm sc scrolling down to the one yeah. that's most relevant to us, which is going to be uh, August 31st, which is when this letter came out. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's no, there's also like no figures in this paper, in this paper, I guess, yeah. this letter. It's really a summary, like a high level summary of the, the data that the FDA saw <laughs> that made them make this decision. Um, but it's kind of, and then, yeah, and then in the, in the preprint, then, then some data comes through. Uh, let's yeah. see, did I highlight it? Oh, it's on page 11. Uh, yep, we're on page 11, so August 31st, looking at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a bivalent interesting concept, because uh, 
with, well, one one thought was like you can either give a straight up Omicron booster where the spike protein is based off of the Omicron strain, but uh -huh. here they decided to do something different. They decided to mix the original the, the original version of the spike and the Omicron strain in equal amounts in the vaccine, and then mm -hmm. give that to to people in this trial. Um, yep. <clears throat> so, so this trial has been released as a preprint. Um, uh, yeah. So, so like yeah, we can flip. Let's flip over to that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, straight down to the big figures. Um, yeah, the big figures. So, of course, oh, I guess, yeah, uh, figure one is like the trial profile. You can see how many people they trialed it in. Um, it's less than before, but again, they're not watching these people to see if they end up getting COVID or not. They're really just looking at the neutralization profiles and saying, was this better than um, if they just got the, the single monovalence original mRNA? Uh, versus the one that has the Omicron added in. Yeah, these are like the phase two slash three trials where they do a little bit of data mm -hmm. on, on, on like, it's mostly focused on safety, but also they yeah. have a bit of value added when it comes to uh, the neutralization profiles. And then they're, they're mm -hmm. going to follow this group like further for forward to see whether it has protective effects. Um, right. The mm -hmm. main thing they're looking for is uh, Non-inferiority, so the, they had to make sure this vaccine is not worse at protecting as the previous ones have gone out, because that would be a problem. And, yeah. <clears throat> and look, yeah. And for yeah, and sorry. and specifically, it's non-inferiority in in the correlate for immunity, so like in neutralizing antibody titers. Which I mean, if you think about how we had the original ones come through, we saw that the antibody titers were sort of correlated to the efficacy in reducing severe disease and so forth. So that's part of the reason why there isn't like a giant full scale, right? Like uh, phase three trial done on this. Uh, uh, like the data is not robust in that way, but it is good enough because we have all that previous data from seeing how this mRNA vaccine worked. And, and again, that's part of the excitement that people had when this uh, vaccine first came out is that it it gives us this flexibility because all that really changes is what we're making inside and so you can make sort of from a first principles understanding of the vaccine that very little has changed in it right that should affect these profiles and so seeing even just seeing the safety information from this thousand people like should be good in terms of and seeing that the correlative immunity is relatively unchanged or it's not inferior to that correlative immunity that that should be that should give us confidence that the vac the booster is good or the vaccine is good yeah so <laughs> i think the, the key thing is they also yeah they definitely don't want any differences in systemic or local because i think if there's mm -hmm. any big differences and that would would ju wouldn't just hurt this vaccine candidate but any every other subsequent one there's an RNA vaccine. Absolutely, think, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like in really some, to... yeah, in some ways this is also setting up for like the future of vaccines. Like this could be a really good platform for future flu vaccines as well. And in some ways we're seeing some data here to help us feel like, okay, like of course we'd have to see it in the flu context, but like this could be something that this technology ends up being used in different ways, right? To, to, to suppress um, viruses that have a lot of uh, variation. <laughs> Yeah, which I guess SARS-CoV-2 has turned out to be. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to update the way we regulate this vaccine because if because at the moment uh, SARS-CoV-2 is evolving new strains slightly faster than we can get new vaccines approved mm -hmm. if we did it based on the original trials like mm -hmm. strategy. So mm -hmm. they are going to have to like iterate rather than so. Yeah. I guess approach approach it the same way that uh, they do with other vaccine candidates that require frequent changes. Yeah, which is flu. I, I think that's the only other. I, is there another vaccine that comes out so I frequently? Don't I don't think, think so. so. Yeah, I don't think so either. So like this really is. I mean, I guess <laughs> I think we've said it before. You know, the best thing would be if we didn't have so many variants of SARS-CoV-2, and like that requires sort of global vaccine efforts and global participation. Also, like within our own cities, right? Like just keeping the rates low enough because like, who knows? Um, uh, we just before this talked that like mask mandates have ended on some public transit stuff. And so like we could see spikes in infection within like even like well vaccinated populations and that could be a driver for evolution. We, d we don't know. Um, but yeah, anyways, those are other things that, that, that this paper can't tell us about or can't really shed light on. But like there are other factors, right? Uh, but uh, but the tool that we have at play right now 
is, uh, yeah, these updated boosters. And uh, yeah, from this data, the adverse events, they look pretty consistent. And so that can make us confident that we could continuously churn out, you know, on, I guess, a little bit of a delay, though, uh, these types of like tailored uh, vaccines. Um, and they would at least be as good, <laughs> if not better than, um, yeah, if not better than vaccines that are out there. <clears throat> Yeah, um, and so what they do, they do find that um, the vaccine. So I think they find that the reactivity of this vaccine is about the same for the original strains, and I think slightly better for Omicron. Uh, yeah. See if I. So uh, I think in my notes it was I think the effectiveness was I think sixty percent higher or something like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. but it was, yeah, if you, uh, was quite... figure three, figure three has like the bar charts of the neutralizing titers. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the figure three. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I think the, the main, main takeaway, is, so I'm, he looked at uh, testing against ancestral strain and people with like all participants, no prior infection and prior infection. Um, mm -hmm. so I should point out, this is quite an interesting cohort because they had made sure to get people who had both boosters. Um, mm. So, which means that if they had prior infection, it is more likely this population would have been infected with Omicron than other strains because Omicron is more vaccine resistant. So I think that's something mm -hmm. to maybe take into account here. But it, but basically, it seems like that. So the ones I'd really want to focus on is in people with no prior infection, seeing see the difference in reactivity. Um, mm -hmm. to, and it does seem like that the there is a greater like reactivity for. For people like to Omicron pre booster, I'm sorry, after the boost. Yeah. Yeah. So that's B, right? You're saying no prior infection in B. Looking at the day 29 versus the day 29, it's like slightly higher. Yeah. And, and I, it's actually the same for prior infection, but the confidence bars are kind of larger. Yeah. At the end of the day, they aren't looking, though, for superiority in this particular metric, just that it's not worse than that original booster. And like, we're sort of following the logic that. It should be better at some level because we are doing something more specific. Like at least whatever neutralizing antibodies are being made here, like they should have some element that's selected for uh, against Omicron more than uh, just having like a regular booster. Yeah, that these are like proxies for immunity. They're not necessarily going to tell us uh -huh. the whole story about it, but they are giving us a hint as to how well the immune system is doing against these strains. Uh, that mm -hmm. being said, it does seem like the even with this extra booster, the it's not like Omicron is being neutralized at the same level as the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 by this vaccine. It's just yeah, still seems to be yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, like if you look at those absolute numbers, right on top yeah. of the ones inside the yeah the ancestral strain versus the Omicron, like all those absolute numbers on Omicron are lower. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not like as good as we'd want it to be, I think, at this stage. And I think there's a lot of other things yeah. I'd like to dig into because, of course. T cell response is going to be very different, perhaps potentially. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in finding out what kind of epitopes are created by, like, if you give these two. So, I mean, for instance, we saw in a previous paper that uh, you mm -hmm. can bias the antibody response to the S2 fragment, which tends to be more yes. conserved between all the strains. And maybe if mm -hmm. you get more S2 epitopes, that could be an interesting correlate for not just immunity against, like, uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, but also maybe other coronavirus mm -hmm. variants. So that's another sort of thing yeah. I'd like to dig into a little bit. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, that they this they, they are not even thinking about that strategy. Right. Like we talked about that strategy in the last the our, in our last episode, and yeah, they're not thinking about that. This is like they're going down the paces of just like making sure those receptor binding domains or like right those 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 small pieces of variation in the spike protein between the two are switched. Um, but they aren't thinking about, yeah, trying to make like sort of a, or directing the antibody response to an entirely different section of the, of, of, of the spike protein. Yeah, I think they're mostly mm -hmm. thinking of like, will this work? It's very much in the empirical, like we need to, we just need a treatment that works. It doesn't matter how it works yet. We can figure that out in the future, but at the moment yeah. we want to get a boost yeah. so that works and we can do all this right. other stuff afterwards. <laughs> and I think maybe I, I do want to say this because I think you touched on it briefly. It works, but it's not, I don't think you should think of it as if you like for those who will get the booster, which if it's recommended in your area, like I think that that's a good choice to, to make. Um, so like if you do get this booster, it's not again, 100% Omicron's uh, protection, right? Or anything like that. It's like, seems like it's better than if it wasn't, but 
um, probably will also still see breakthrough infections, especially if behavior is, isn't changing or maybe especially <laughs> in the case of, of having like sort of more, um, yeah, more fluid mixing and, and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, um, Yes, you can... So I think that's all. Yeah, that's all I want to say about. Oh no, actually, I don't want to say one more thing about Moderna. Okay. So one interesting thing in the news, right, that I saw was that. So this data is for this BA1 um, mRNA spike protein that they put inside. Uh, it, yeah, that they put inside of the liposomes, and uh, on this on this data, the FDA gave approval for for this, and I think I saw Canada and the UK did as well. Um, but then I saw that more data was released to the FDA that talked about, like, I think, I think they're animal studies, animal studies done with BA4 and BA5 versions of that mRNA, right? And again, the logic is BA1 is actually gone mm. uh, if we think about what's out there. And we're seeing actually BA4 and 5 being the circulating. So, um, so more data was released to the FDA, which we I couldn't find on the internet, so I can't show you guys today. But on the basis of that data, the FDA says that the US is going to get BA4 and BA5 like versions of this mRNA vaccine. Um, and again, using that same logic, I think, the reason why they say this is like they're using this logic of we already see in this BA1 case that the adverse events seem to be comparable. Um, and like that sets us up like we have no theoretical reason to understand that those adverse events would be different if we just again changed a few amino acids on the spike protein and the potential benefit for that would be having more specific antibodies and I guess I assume that that's what they saw in the data in the animal data right that having a few more amino acid changes there gives us better neutralizing titers against these specific uh, BA4 and BA5 circulating strains so yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that I, I feel like at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this pandemic, like there's there are so many eyes on this sort of data that like there would be more um, demands, I guess, to see show 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 us the data before these decisions were being made. But I think now I, I maybe public uh, interest has waned a little bit, and uh, there just isn't the same the same amount of like yeah like data right at our fingertips here. <clears throat> Thing is, this is a proven technology now. Mm -hmm. But when it started, like mRNAs was like very. I don't think there was any vaccine that was based on mRNAs, mm -hmm. and now it went from like almost being non-existent to being in almost in so many people's arms now. Totally, that there is now an increased level of trust and yeah. safety data like this kind of allows people to take the extra leap to go like, well, do we really need to go through this administrative hoop, or can we just go straight to? A vaccine right um, and I will say yeah like I think that's a really big vote of confidence as well it's just like the the vaccines that are already in everybody right people have been jabbed with this vaccine several times and adverse events have been collected sort of just on the post right uh, like after vaccine and and nothing really terrible has come out I mean there is the known issues with like heart stuff but like that's yeah. well known and doctors can take that into account when they're giving these boosters right and like give appropriate recommendations for people that fall into um yeah into specific categories um so yeah that's that, that's where we are i think with with the moderna vaccine <clears throat> yeah and pfizer on the same day pfizer also got a letter from the fda which is mm -hmm. uh posted up here there's links to all of this in the comments as well mm -hmm. uh well, not in the comments in the doobly-doo um in our zotero library <laughs> yeah and the, the Pfizer vaccine is interesting because it's also like a bivalent vaccine in the same way that the Moderna vaccine is, mm -hmm. uh, but with uh, BA4 slash 5, they say. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, because uh, apparently, like, according to them, it's like, for all intents and purposes, they treat BA4 and 5 as if they're the same. Um, yeah, I guess they chose the they chose the sequences that are, like, similar between the two. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's my guess. Um but again, like there's a lot of like history in each of these uh, of, um, but yeah, essentially like they yeah, page uh, twelve. Oh, you're on it. Page twelve is page where 12. they talk oh, okay. about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> page twelve. Let's go to that. These are long, long letters. They're so um, long. No, so this one, it's this is also still BA one. The data coming through. I I don't quite understand. Like you looked at a footnote earlier, right? And it says BA four and BA five. 
I, yeah. I think there's something about like the way that they copied these letters, these typos, is, is, is my is my thought. But I, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I, just, I mean, the thing about letters like these is quite a lot of them are just Control C, Control V uh, from I, previous ones. I don't yeah. think anyone actually constructs a narrative from each of these letters. They're all just like kind of box ticking exercises because right. Uh, except except uh, we're like, except we're readers, trying to construct the narrative. Stuff you read. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 you're right in what you said, but I'm saying like, but we're trying to construct the narrative and it makes it quite frustrating to, to read these in some ways and be like, so what is going on here exactly? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, what's going on here is basically loading a bunch of facts and, and then uh -huh. like hoping that the overwhelming amount of facts will kind of stifle what people from kind of responding to things. Well, um, <laughs> And, and, and I think convince, it's about convincing this regulatory committee. And like, it's, it's not about, like, the, the regulatory committee does want to see certain things. But yeah, like some of the details, I don't think that they're digging for it. Like they're listening to it in like a meeting of some this, sort, right? They're asking questions in a meeting. This yeah. is kind of like the public justification for it. Because this is from the regulatory committee to ostensibly yes. the, the Pfizer to yes, to, uh, kind of do that announcement. Like, look, this is fine. Right. Uh, right. This is why it's fine. Right. And uh, this is why we've arrived at the decision we've made. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they probably have like they. I mean, this is probably all everything that that the on that decision being written down here. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not the most like riveting of letters. To, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and from the from our perspective, where we're like reading journal articles and stuff, and trying to drill down into some detail that we think might be important, it also doesn't give us that in these letters, right? Like we see some of the details, but we don't see like all of the details. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, oh, I think often these letters are good because as a drug company, it, they would already have a lot of the data they refer to here, mm -hmm. and I think this might just have a. Uh, so again, this isn't gonna. This isn't. This is a, form, a formality that they're sending these out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think it's important for the public to be able to read the, this and to be able to to scrutinize it. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and feel confident that like the decision is being made in a way that, um, yeah, that 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 isn't corrupted by some right. Like in some ways, there's also like democratic oversight is like the reason why these are being released in, in this format. Um, yeah, and to do that oversight, you don't always need the full data set. It's just like, but that's like why we exist, right? Like we, we want to look at those things. And so that's why if, if I feel like if, if I sound like I'm like slightly disappointed by the details in this, it's just it's just from that perspective. <laughs> well, I'm going to find a mistake and then spin out an anti-vaccine channel with all motivated reasoning. Oh, they made a spelling mistake. Vaccine's burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Point three months. How does that make sense? That's not a measurement. We measure things in weeks in our house. How dare they? Um. Um, but yeah, so the same thing in here. They they had like um, a, a bunch of studies that are generally focused on um, sa safety information, but also looking at neutralization as a correlative immunity. In this case, Pfizer doesn't have a preprint um, with that information, but we do have the presentation that they did show to the FDA instead. <laughs> yeah, so this has which a which would be the same figures data. probably. Yeah. Things saying things that we already know, like oh look, lots of strains coming out. Uh, we, what do we do about it? Well, who, mm -hmm. who has a key? Well, there's yeah. They talk a bit about like different vaccine can wait candidates. So you look at uh, a pure monovalent Omicron vaccine uh, mm -hmm. to use as a fourth uh, booster, and mm -hmm. and they also like do a lot of GMT. So GMT is geometric mean titer. So that's Essentially, a measure of how many antibodies there are, because I think every, I mean, the mathematics of it are a bit uh, complicated, but essentially, it's yeah. like where the average, where the middle of the data is, essentially. Yeah. Um, and GMFR is the uh, geometric mean uh, rate, so that's compared to a control. So mm. whenever you see like a number under that, that's you can imagine that as almost being like, oh, it's two to two times as effective, or three times as effective, or if it's one, then it's kind of uh, zero, like, there's no no better, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip through a bunch of these, but again, if you want to go through, through these yourself, everything's in the comments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm going to skip to the interesting graphs, because they've got, they test out um, the single dose Omicron, and they test out the bivalent vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, the, the titers seem to be around the same, 
Uh, I mean, the bivalent vaccines, if you squint, they look a little bit lower. But, uh, I mean, they look a fair bit bit lower. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think the, the thing that we need to take into account here is I think people want to, they want to be prepared against future strains. And they have no idea whether something will come from the ancestral strain. Yeah. So uh, that is... Uh, Going for a bivalent van vaccine is kind of a hedge to try and make sure that they're covered in case something else goes wrong. Yeah, like we're, um, we're still getting a booster for ancestral <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 in addition to some booster for the Omicron. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that like th it's the same reasoning, right? Like that that Moderna is using to, to cho choose bivalent over monovalent. Um, and in some ways like this, the Pfizer vaccine is so similar to the Moderna one as well, um, being an mRNA one wrapped in a, in a, in a liposome. <laughs> yeah, and here's an interesting one where they test the, uh, the, the bivalent vaccines against BA1 and BA4 slash 5 to see whether mm. they react. And mm -hmm. there does seem to be some, some crossover, but yep. I think significantly more crossover in some of the bivalent groups than with the uh, single dose Omicron ones. Mm-hmm. Although, again, Which actually might be, it might be nice just thinking about like how the ancestral booster is helping like boost titers to antibodies that are useful against like all variants sort of thought process. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that's where they're going with this. I think yeah. they, they do look at, um, cause I think here they compare against all like three strains. Um, mm -hmm. And it does d definitely look like the, the bivalent Omicron strain is doing better against, has has better broadness compared to the, yep. the, just giving the... The four and five. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting to think then too, like, so so then actually emerging in the differences between the booster, again, if the booster is indicated for you and you're in your area, you should probably get that booster. But um, like there is going to, there is a difference maybe then between like, at least the, the Moderna one that is going to end up coming to this, to uh, uh, people living in America, like with the BA4 and BA5 one, like that's, uh, yeah, it must, it, something in that animal study must say that it did even better against four and five, but there's still benefit for getting just like regular booster <laughs> against against variants, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's the must have thing this winter. Uh, <laughs> make sure you're prepared. Uh, oh gosh, sorry, I realize I've, right, let me, I forgot to, sh oh, okay, so here are the graphs that I've been talking about, but I, <laughs> I switched it so they look just looking at our faces, watching, reading the graphs. Oh, I so, see. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so this is the I think the key thing to to illustrate why the bivalent booster was the thing, why yeah. the bivalent booster was the one they looked at. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, but I think that that's all I really want to say about these these boosters that are coming through down the pipeline. Um, does that sound good to you, Fuzz? <clears throat> yeah, that sounds good to me. We can move on to the next thing. We're still on the prospect of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, but this one is a different, it's much more, it's much earlier experimental phase. It's titled a universal SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV DNA vaccine inducing highly cross-reactive neutralizing antibodies and T cells. Um, mm -hmm. so here, DNA vaccines, again, I'm not the greatest fan of DNA vaccines because like a lot of the ones we've talked about, this one uh, is administered via electroporation. So, <laughs> so electroporation, for those of you who don't know, is where, in this case, they inject you with the DNA. This is pure DNA, just like what's found in your cells. And then in order to get into your cells, they pre add two prongs and run an electric current through it, which, I mean, we don't, we don't tell, this is mostly based on animals, so we don't necessarily know how painful it is, but it, it, they do give them, the animals, like an, pain relief and like analgesia. Yep. So the, um, mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is like these kind of this DNA, this has to be a DNA vaccine because they include a load of genes on that. So RNA vaccines yeah. have almost like a size limit where if you have get it too long, the RNA strand will just break down or get chewed up. DNA. Yeah, I mean, typically mRNA inside of our cells, it's like a one strand of mRNA gives us one protein and then maybe some splice variants. But that's like that's all single strand. But in DNA, yeah, you can have a really long construct and multiple pieces of RNA come off of that one piece of DNA. <clears throat> yeah. So they so with the bivalent vaccine, you've got two, 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 two bits of like like spike protein, well, both and from like two strains, whereas this one has spike protein from three species of coronavirus. You got your beta, yeah. beta, beta variant, the South African variant, for those of you who've been around for a long time. You got the 
the B one one seven variant, which I think was the beta variant, um, uh, the UK variant, um, mm-hmm. and human coronavirus, which is like a cold virus, and yep. putting them all together, along with a few uh, nuclear, with a few like other genes. I think the M protein and N protein, yeah. which are also quite important. Yeah, so the N protein being nuclear capsid, that's like wrapping the genome typically. Um, that's the yeah. protein that. Uh, a lot of uh, rapid antigen tests are looking for, right? When we're looking for antibodies against that protein, uh, or, or, or that protein rather. And then the M protein, like the matrix, that's usually embedded inside of the envelope, inside of the, the membrane of the virus. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and so I think we've talked about this before, how like if you add more proteins to a vaccine, you almost give your immune system a broader target to aim for. Mm-hmm. And it gets harder for the virus to evolve away from it because mm-hmm. instead of trying to evolve one gene, it has to evolve lots of different genes, some of whom are essential to its function. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And they also add like an IgE leader, which is kind of, I think, something to support antibody production. Um, but yeah. Um, it's really interesting what they kind of do to try and... F- so, again, I think the vaccine candidate itself is quite interesting. Not a fan of getting electrocuted, but uh, <laughs> this yeah. is and trying to get... And another thing I was thinking about is we read about DNA vaccines. Like, there was that hypothesis that one of the reasons why the adenoviral one caused some higher amount of adverse events was, like, because of the splicing that could have been done to the mRNA that comes off of DNA. And so, you know, again, there's additional design considerations when thinking about the DNA vaccines. uh, Yeah, Yeah, that's right, because because when you put in a DNA uh, strand, it it needs to go inside the nucleus in order to get Mm -hmm. transcribed. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, like you get other cells that post process it and then proteins into small sections. So you have to be careful to make sure that that you're getting the right protein expressed at the surface so that the immune so yeah, there's a lot of like interesting considerations with DNA vaccines that aren't necessarily dug into in this paper. Um, right. But but what this paper does show is that their sort of their mega construct is is good at producing um, like a very wide spectrum of antibodies against. Well, they've they've given us a wide spectrum of antigens, so maybe no surprise that you get a wider spectrum of antibodies, and those antibodies help. Um, help neutralize virus. Yeah, Yeah. and they definitely focus a lot on T cells as well. Uh, They're trying Mm -hmm. to look at um, what type of T cell response this this kind of uh, vaccine can produce. Um, And so you get a fair fair bit more details on on that and a few survival assays, but um, so it looks generally okay. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, there are lots of vaccines out there competing. And the, the big question is whether this can fulfill the needs of being broad enough to to, to not have variants evolve very quickly to it, enough to to pre- prevent the actual disease rather than to prevent death. So can it yeah. prevent transmission? So these are the sorts of things that it, will have to be answered in the future for this. Um, in the in the introduction to this paper, I thought it was interesting how they yeah they focused a lot on that T cell part of it, and they specifically used the reasoning that if you think about how the variants have had all this immune evading capacity, and yet the the vaccine still prevented severe disease in in a lot of people and so they were saying like that disconnect must give importance to the t cell in all of this because that would be another immune component that isn't being measured as much right and like we're not commenting on when we say like the immune evasive ability of of a certain variant right like the immune evasive ability ability of a variant is said from the standpoint of neutralizing antibody, but it's not being said on the standpoint of these T cells. So, so the authors of this paper sort of use that rationalization to say like, well, T cells must be important, right? And like d- diving into it. And we've said it before, I think on, on this episode and, and probably you guys have also heard it on the news, right? That like there are other components to immunity, not just the neutralizing antibodies. Um, and yeah, and maybe it's, maybe it is T cells against like nuclear capsid that could be really protective. And we just don't have like, um, we don't have the craft in our uh, ability to make uh, vaccines right now to like specifically target that <laughs> as, as, as and, and test for that as, as the primary immunity we're creating with our vaccines. But, but, but the vaccines we put in do create that at some level. 
um, and maybe it helps when when you throw everything the kitchen sink basically into into the mix. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I think that's pretty much where we where we are with that one. I think mm -hmm. we would like to move on to the next paper: reduced sensitivity of commercial spike-specific antibody assays after primary infection with the SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is just like a little paper. It's not even a very large amount of people that were studied in this. Like 37 uh, individuals were studied in this paper. But I thought it was interesting because um, figure two <laughs> gives this like really big overview of a bunch of different types of uh, antigen tests that exist out there. I guess you could get um, antigen tested in a hospital potentially. Uh, we haven't talked about that much, but at the beginning of the pandemic, or like I guess in the middle of the pandemic, people were saying that we could do serology, serology, like looking for antibodies against different parts of the virus in order to get a sense of who has been infected and how many times and by what variant, something like that. So like that's everything above the dotted line uh, are these types of tests. Uh, I think typically maybe blood would be taken, but they might also be rapid antigen tests. I don't 100% know. And then below that dotted line are these nucleocapsid um, antigen tests, which I think are the much more common lateral mm. flow tests that are floating around. Like I recognize the Abbott SARS-CoV-2 IgG, IgG one. Like I, I think that I've taken that one a couple times. Um, and so like, uh, yeah, so I thought it's interesting to see the breakdown of all of this, but then also that uh, doesn't all like, um, in, for people who get Omicron, uh, it's more it's more likely that um, antigen tests against the receptor binding domain and the spike protein or any of those variable areas that we know in Omicron, uh, they come up, they, the chances of having a false negative uh, are a little bit higher in those. Uh, and that should come as no surprise as well, right? Because we know that those things are changing. And I think that's why like these lateral flow tests that everyone is using, it's good that they're against nucleocapsid because they don't see the same difference uh, in nucleocapsid. Like nucleocapsid recognizing wild type and Omicron pretty much equally. Um, but yeah, if we choose spike and anti-RBD, uh, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> yeah, and I guess this makes sense in, in hindsight because Omicron has changed the structure of the S protein so much. And mm -hmm. it is quite mm -hmm. interesting that antigens, I mean, this looking at these graphs, I think it shows it most clearly because what you'd want is these graphs to be almost even on both sides. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what you find is that they're very lopsided on, on one side. Then the moment you get into nuclear capsids, they're mirrors. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> good graph design. I like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, just from like a quick view, right? You kind of get the sense like what's off, which qu quadrant's off and like what, what does that correlate with? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I I think that's basically all I have to say about this. It's a very simple, straightforward study. But, yeah. But I mean, the results are quite clear. Yeah, that's all I want to say too. It's kind of small as well. Like, so it's also like take the, yeah, there's there's other stuff to think about. Uh, and then yeah. that brings us out of our SARS-CoV-2 coverage, but we still have a little bit of a pandemic to talk about. Uh, a research letter yeah. from JAMA. JAMA. Yeah, JAMA. <laughs> About monkey. So this is a compassionate use of tecovirumat for the treatment of monkeypox infection. Now, so tecovirumat is a, uh, I think it's a drug that's been t that's being developed against what, smallpox or smallpox-like viruses. If I recall mm -hmm. correctly, let me check my notes of whether I'm correct. Yeah, or not. I, I, I believe it is. Yeah, smallpox and the orthopox virus family. Yeah. That that that's the family that the pox and monkeypox are both in. Mm -hmm. So the natural thing is now that you've got monkeypox infection, now's the chance to let this, try and get this uh, drug out and tested. And so they decided to do this uh, study, which was for compassionate use, which is, I mm -hmm. think there's like interesting co uh, issues with it potentially, because again, this isn't like a, a clinical trial and it's very much not, not like, because for the, I mean, this is a paper that is, there's no control. Yeah, there's no there's control. No control. <laughs> they, in fact, this because I know we vowed to not bring up papers to tear apart. I don't want to, te but uh, <laughs> when I picked this paper, I thought it was going to be a lot better than it was. Um, but I think and it's also not a paper; it's just a letter. It's, like, it's more yeah, like it's, um, it's just a bunch of like researchers showing their their studies. I don't think they're like they're just showing things honestly. I don't think they they've got any like kind of agenda in pushing tecovirumab. Te Otherwise, if they did, they wouldn't yeah. publish the paper. I think they just want to show honestly what uh, this drug uh -huh. does. Um, uh -huh. And uh -huh. so uh, what we get is um, 
they, they so they give they get a bunch of patients uh, who've had monkeypox. So uh, on average, they ca caught them after they've had ten to twelve days of symptoms, and then they gave mm -hmm. them tecavirumab and monitored how long it took for the uh, symptoms to resolve. And so mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the table, it take after getting tecavirumab. By, by 21 days, nearly all the patients had cleared it, except one or two who also had HIV. Um, and I think quite a few had cleared it by the seven days. The one issue, is in, the kind of elephant in the room here, is that the average time, it, the time that it takes for monkeypox to resolve is about three weeks. Mm -hmm. so, so the fact that it result, they find that after three weeks of treatment, it resolves, doesn't necessarily show that the drug works. Um, and if mm -hmm. and if you look at and I think they they do test it. So the important time point is at seven days, and even that is quite hard to to interpret because some of the people who were resolved at seven days were caught very late in the infection. So there's yeah. one guy who was like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a semen guy, I, but one person who was uh, caught off they had the the disease for 21 days. It was you'd cleared it by seven days, and that that's something you would wouldn't. That's something you would expect even without treatment. So mm -hmm. this is very much a, a, it could have an effect, but with a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of like uh, antiviral drugs, sometimes the effect is a lot, is very subtle sometimes. Yeah, um, totally. And, um, and, and at the end of the day, I think this paper, this letter, it's like, it's very much like by doctors for doctors, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, um, like it's not meant for, uh, yeah, it, it's meant to show people like what has been done in the clinic and what people might expect to see. Um, you know, medicine is like this like complicated mix, right? Every patient is different, has different things. So like they present all this data in a table so that you can quickly see like the experience that this clinical group has had giving um, this antiviral. And yeah, I, I guess what I also liked about this is that I, I don't, I also just don't, I'm curious about monkeypox, what's going on. Like it's interesting to see how it drew my attention to the idea that people give the vaccine also like in response to a, 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 a potential exposure. So, so some of these people have had their first vaccination because, you know, like, uh, again, it's a slower um, virus potentially, like the course of infection. And so maybe like getting that vaccine uh, will give you that boost of antibodies that you need to, to meet it uh, before it sort of uh, uh, explodes into a, a more dangerous disease. Um, yeah. And that's true for rabies. I know that that's like a big rabies thing. Like people say, like if you get bitten far away from your brain by some potentially rabies infected animal, like you could, you still have a lot of time to be fully vaccinated by the time that virus is uh, has sort of taken the slow path in neurons back to your brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is interesting because I think this is more of like yeah, this shows people like what they've done. I think that that's mm -hmm. quite important. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, like, and yeah, because this isn't like this is basically people. People have taken, yeah, this data that's important for people to know. It's not necessarily, I mean, for, for this kind of show where I want to show like, oh, this is a big cure. It's, it's got like, it isn't that. It is very much, uh, yeah. here's something that's done. Here's the effect. Uh, take, just make your own decision over whether you'd like to prescribe this or not. Yeah, I think, um, I think we're always, like, first of all, I feel like we're, fairly conservative in the way that we interpret stuff. Like we don't like to make big claims. So like this is even further away from that. <laughs> like, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. So essentially what they'd say with compassionate use is, okay, well, there isn't any gonna be any harm in doing it. Mm -hmm. I think is the main thing. Mm -hmm. So try it, but this is what we found so far. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before we move on, oh yeah, I, we don't have anything about the polio stuff in New York. I like in terms of like papers or things, if you have some news, you should tweet us about it, I think. Um, but like from my understanding, what I heard in the news, it's like unvaccinated populations of people who aren't getting polio vaccines are also getting polio now. Not gonna lie, um, this is literally the first time I've been hearing it. Uh, you got polio <laughs> back in the US? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> At least yeah, because like, <laughs> um, yeah, plenty of folks, there are, there are communities that haven't been vaccinated regularly, and so the outbreaks are in those communities right now. Um, okay, moving on. Again, if you want us, if you want us to talk, yeah, if you want to talk more about it, please uh, send us the papers that you think are relevant or some of the news articles. We we may be able to 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 comment uh, in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, 
So next paper is a giant mimivirus. So uh, this this is a giant uh, mimivirus, one point two megabyte genome. Is L megabyte? Sorry, meg <laughs> megabase <laughs> genome. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> The giant mimivirus 1.2 MB genome is elegantly organized into a 13 nanometer diameter helical protein shield. Mm -hmm. um, so giant viruses, they were discovered a, a while back. They're pretty much almost as big as like some bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they have a l interesting like internal structure. And this one, this paper like delves into that, tries to understand exactly what is going on with that using one of the show's favorite technique, which is a giant... Uh, uh, what's it? Um, Cryo-electron micro microscopy. Yep. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna pull up some of these. So I'm gonna pull up some slides quickly because usually uh, eLife has some great video on, but um, unfortunately, uh, this paper is still quite early access, so it doesn't have that yet. Yeah, this only has in PDF form, so you have to like scroll to the bottom to see all the pictures they have. Um, but yeah, I, I think that one of the things we can think about here is that big genomes need organization because having just like a really long like strand of DNA floating around inside of a capsid, that is, um, th that can be difficult to manage in some ways. Um, and so maybe it's no surprise that such a big genome has some sort of organization. Uh, specifically, these, these investigators found some methodology to sort of gently break apart the mimivirus so that as not to disrupt some of the structure inside. And then by looking under cryo-electron microscopy, I think they also use regular TEM, transmission electron microscopy as well, they see like these fibers, like sort of thicker fibers than you would expect from a strand of DNA, indicating to them that there must be some protein stuff going on. Um, and so essentially these are viral chromosomes. I don't know if that's the wrong way to use the word chromosome, but like that's, in my mind, that's how I'm thinking about it. I can understand why you're saying that because these aren't just like strands of DNA. They're, they're being held together by these proteins that kind of protect them. Mm -hmm. So like I think in, in part A in this thing, you can see that they're all tightly wound up. And then when it enters mm -hmm. into a cell, it kind of like blobs out this, oh, I think like, I guess like Wait, nucleus like do, thing. Do you have, nucleus. Do you have the image, Fuzz? I still see the, oh no, no, never mind. It's just our screen share. I see it on the stream. <laughs> okay. You got it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So you got this like nucleoid, which has all the genetic material and they pop out and show like these giant strands of like viruses. And they are tightly, the DNA is tightly wound up by these proteins. Mm -hmm. I think this paper is analyzing exactly what's going on with that that winding. Um, yep, uh, they find out that yeah, so they see like actually two thick or three thicknesses of these windings. Um, they have like a, and they just name them like compressed, <laughs> not like they just name them C something C eleven C thirteen C twelve C thirteen just for compression of this whatever. That that's all it means. Um, they identify the protein that is wound up around these um, uh, or on these fibers. That protein is GMC oxoreductase, uh, yes. which is the same protein that they see in fibers that extend from the capsid of the mimivirus. Which, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting because I think uh, because that capsid is part of that capsid's function. It's a fool of bacteria. It's right, fool an amoeba into thinking it's a bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't really expecting to see it being wrapped around DNA. And Absolutely. again, with giant viruses, uh, I mean, again, they're still viruses. So having a gene that performs more, more than one function is useful. But mm -hmm. giant viruses have a lot of space to them. So they could potentially have, have lots of other genes wrapped up in them. Yeah, um, and I think they do. I think they do some proteomic analysis of these fibers to find other proteins that are associated, and they find yes. RNA polymerase in there, which sort of makes sense. Like, if you have a genome, if you have the RNA polymerase already attached, then it's ready to make that RNA as soon as it gets to the right place. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so they do a lot of mapping of that structure, and they also, like, uh, figure out the whole C1A, C1... So they got this, like... Video I'm showing on the screen where they yes, look flat. at the level of compression and figure out okay well it's actually because they're all the same strand but they're different flexibilities and you got your RNA polymerase like linked up in in that structure as well mm -hmm. so there's a lot of kind of interesting things in how how the DNA is wrapped up yeah yeah this is really it's wild to me to see this. I think I also just don't know that much about viruses. I, I, like after reading this, I'm like, ah, oh, I realize I don't know because I think I've, because also 
the monkeypox virus, orthopoxoviruses, those are also considered big genomes. And I don't really know about their genome organization, but I'm sure it's fascinating too and probably has complexity to it. Um, yeah, but here's one that I think people have not known before. And uh, yeah, again, sort of a really interesting discovery from that perspective. Yeah, it's interesting because megaviruses, they are just so much larger than, yeah. than other viruses. And mm -hmm. so, and yeah, I mean, how many copies of the genome does it have? Because even here, it looks like, I mean, there's a question of whether this was four copies of the genome or is this one, one strand that was wrapped up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think, is that is that cyan thing that is supposed to be like a RNA polymerase maybe? I think so. Yeah. I don't have the key with me at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think it might be just, or something. It's definitely something, because like they did, I, when I was reading this, or when I was skimming the paper, I did see that they were, they did specifically say like there is spacing in there for these other things. And they started even talking about, is there space for the genome? Because like the double-stranded genome has to also split apart if the RNA polymerase is going to have access to the code in order to make RNA. Yeah. And so like they were even trying to speculate on how much space in there is there to even like split apart and does transitions between these different compression levels of the fibers like indicate like something about the openness of like what can be transcribed or not. Um, yeah, there's still a lot sort of that isn't known and there's so much to think about now that we have this structure to start hypothesizing over. <clears throat> uh, yeah, com completely. I mean, here they've got a picture where they've broken up the, D the, the strand and they found like things that they think are RNA preliminaries have spilled out of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we've got like a, the structure of the like kind of the different subunits that make up up this uh, this thing, this uh, so this um, this protective sheath um, that they yep. call. I think Meg. I can't. Oh, sorry, I can't remember what they call it. But they have a nice fancy word. Like, I think genomic genome fibers. I think they call them. Um, yeah, genome genome fibers. Mm -hmm. And and within one fiber, you can have multiple states of the compression. So it's not like there's a fiber and it's like stuck in this one compression mode. They they say that like along the fiber, you could see some that were like, oh, there's a section that's looser and not. And that's why I want to call it a chromosome, even though maybe that's a really bad word. Like there's all these connotations on it, but like that just like seems so chromosome like, like having a way to control the unwindingness of DNA in different sections. <clears throat> uh yeah for for real uh it's yeah this because there's a lot of things that are, have like almost that are similar to what we'd see in not even bacteria but eukaryotes here mm -hmm. um i mean there are bacteria have their own things that they use to protect the genome but i think that they they're a lot more complexity than what you expect from a virus absolutely um but that's all i want to say about this uh we and we our next paper, or are you good, Fuzz, as well? I'm going to just, like, moving things behind the scenes. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah. And so for our next paper, we're still talking about giant viruses, but now, like, a little bit more about how they are in nature and actually specifically defensive symbiosis against these giant viruses in amoebae. Um, so this is talking about uh, a chlamydia, actually, or related to chlamydia, parachlamydiae. Uh, a, a bacterial endosymbiote of certain amoebae that are susceptible to these giant viruses, but this uh, infection, or I guess uh, symbiosis rather, with the parachlamydiae provides something protective against the lytic nature of these giant viruses. <laughs> yeah, they, they went to like a sewage tank to some, that they knew had lots of giant viruses in it. They sampled out some amoebae and found that they had endosymbionts in them. And they like, uh, in, I, tried out like some tests like giant viruses to see whether they could get infected versus like a control and found like, okay, well, actually these amoebae seem to be uh, resistant to it. Could that be because of the end of um, mm -hmm. So I think they, they, so they couldn't get, so one thing you, you can do in these instances is to cure like uh, amoebae of their end by like kind of convincing them to spit them out. They couldn't do that in that mm -hmm. instance. So what they did instead is they took the end and gave it to end in some amoebae that didn't have them and then tested whether yeah. those could uh, be resistant. They found that, yeah, they, they did, um, mm -hmm. which definitely strongly... And so then they like delved in a little bit deeper to figure out, okay, well, what about the timing of it? So uh, if we like infected the, uh, these amoebae with the endosymbionts and the virus at the same time, what happens? And they, they kind of figure out, that, okay, well, there's still some infection, but it's downregulated. And then, then they go, okay, well, maybe because these endosymbionts take some time to get like established, so if we have uh -huh. it at a point when they're established, 
what uh, where can we uh, arrest the virus in its life cycle and mm-hmm. i think they they figure out that if they uh, they add the enzymes at the right time they can uh, they can get the virus to the point where it creates these factories to produce the virus but then it stops after that um yeah and which is really awesome like uh, i mean you can already guess there's like so much that isn't isn't known in this system right like but now that they have the pieces and they have the phenotype, they can really dive in and say, what proteins are being made? How are those regulated? Like, why do these symbiotes do this, right? Like, as part of, um, yeah, as, as part of their lifestyle. Um, do amoeba have ways of, like, picking up this endosymbiote, right? If they know that they are infected. Um, yeah, it's so, this, I love this paper <laughs> just from that standpoint of, there's, like, so much, there's so much dynamic, stuff that goes on inside of cells, uh, especially when you throw viruses in the mix. Um, it's hard to say like where one living thing begins and the other thing ends. Like this endosymbiosis I feel like is just, um, yeah, is always like so mind blowing for me to, to hear examples of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing that is mind blowing for me is that when you look at these endosymbionts, I find that they actually like slow down the growth of these amoeba. So if you didn't know about the giant viruses, you'd think that these symbionts were parasites. But, <laughs> but for somehow, like these symbionts do have that function. They their only function is to protect the host, which is uh, right. really interesting. Um, but as you said, uh, it's hard to figure out where the host and the symbiote, the the symbiote and the host, uh, where, where the endosymbiote stops and the host begins, which yeah. is a great segue for the next paper. I... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the next one that we have is this accumulation of, oh my gosh, the title is eluding me right now. <clears throat> oh, accumulation of endosymbiont genomes in an insect o- mm. autosome followed by endosymbiont replacement. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they have, uh, it's about this, the model system they have is Drosophila here, so fruit flies, and then uh, they know that Drosophila have this endosymbiote often called Wolbachia. Uh, but they, it's a bacteria that lives inside of them. I think it gets transferred down lines as well. Like uh, It's like within the egg uh, that they get Olbachia. Um, and they have a strain of Drosophila that they treated with antibiotics for so long that it lost its Wolbachia. And so they're able to sequence out the genome then of that particular um, Drosophila and see like, oh, is there, are there still sequences that are like they're into, into, into symbiote in the autosome. And of course, right, like you can, you can imagine that this, um, that this, uh, this particular experimental approach, like they have to be really careful <laughs> of contamination <laughs> because uh, the, the primary challenge here is to make this claim, their primary challenge has to be that it wasn't just random Wolbachia that they sequenced because like ostensibly the lab is full of it <laughs> as they're working and they're really sequencing genomes of uh, of the Drosophila. Um, and so they do, they, they can confirm in a various ways. They can do PCR specifically looking at like the junction between uh, where the Wolbachia insertion is and the Drosophila genome is, right? You can like sort of uh, do PCR to amplify that one part that can give you uh, some some confidence that it's happening. You can look inside the strain and see if mRNAs are being made from these sections. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of bioinformatics that I actually don't have a lot of insight into to tell people about. Uh, but but the takeaway seems to be that there are multiple insertions of the Wolbachia genome. Um, some of entire some some of it it's like in its entirety, just like sitting inside of the Drosophila genome, um, and and also interestingly sort of repetitive versions of them indicating that there might be some functional element to having certain pieces of this genome around inside of the drosophila <laughs> yeah and also like interesting like on the same chromosome a lot of them so a lot of them happen like go enter in the same place i guess is interesting uh i mean is it opens up some more questions like you said about like how because i think it's happened in humans with mitochondria where there has been an exchange mm-hmm. of, of of dna to the point where neither yeah. neither organisms can live without each other because they have that mm-hmm. necessity so i think there are a lot of interest i endosymbionts i think is so it's so fascinating it should almost be its own branch of like microbiology just because of, like, <laughs> yeah the, i think so <laughs> um so i think there there is a lot to unpack with these sorts of things and especially wall is quite an important uh 
thing for pest control because we people are using it trying to create more vacuum strains to reduce malaria infection or other kind of mm -hmm. things we've seen. So yeah, it's a sort of a very broad uh, category of bacteria that infect all these different uh, bugs or insects. And uh, yeah, understanding like the relationship between that. Uh, bacteria and the insect world is important to being able to manipulate <laughs> that bacteria for our own purposes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like a really fascinating part. I just wanted to point out that they also looked for nuclear, in, or sorry, they also looked for mitochondrial genome insertion as well. And so they see both. They see yeah. evidence of this <laughs> Wolbachia genes popping up in the mitochondria genome of Drosophila as well as in its actual autosome. <laughs> Um, which is just, yeah, so uh, it's getting everywhere. And um, I guess one of the things that you maybe suggested a little bit is w when you talked about how like uh, mitochondria were once, right, are thought to be once endosymbiotes that started living with us and now are like fully dependent, we could also see the traces of these things. And they do try to talk about like timing, like mm. when do they think that these insertions happened versus other thing, other rearrangements on the genome? Like how ancient essentially are these insertions? Because timing them appropriate or, or finding the time in which they uh, embedded themselves into the genome may also give us insight as to like what step along evolution are we looking at really when we see these genomes inserted? Is it something that is like happened recently and like, you know, these are just like the test flies just so happen to have some insertions in them? Or is it something that's like, this is like their path to becoming more dependent on each other that like eventually Wolbachia won't have to make certain genes because Drosophila got it. <laughs> like yeah. they're already making the things that, that the Wolbachia needs. Like, uh, yeah. So it's interesting from that perspective. I think they point out that uh, one of the things that I know about Wolbachia and Drosophila is uh, Wolbachia has like a way of um, uh, like s sterilizing Drosophila if they don't have like a corresponding Wolbachia expression inside of them. So it, it, it essentially forces the uh, Drosophila in its evolution not to like be too aggressive against um, like ejecting the, the Wolbachia from its, from its cells. Um, but they do find those same genes that are used to like make sure that the, um, the Drosophila isn't going to be sterile. They see that Drosophila is picking up some of them. So like there is some sort of, you can think of that as some sort of arms race in some way, saying that like, oh, but we have a copy of what we need. We don't need that cell anymore. We have it in our own genome. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, like, so there's definitely very interesting dynamics happening along there. Uh, but again, I, I'm not enough of an <laughs> expert in yeah. this to have uh, picked up on those details just, just from my, I mean, my skin. Same, I was just fascinated by like the kind of codependency that you see with Wolbachia and uh -huh. other. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, uh, I think I've said, we've said everything we need to say on this paper. Mm -hmm. well, uh, mm -hmm. So moving on to the next paper, which is, uh, uh, let me put on, well, gosh. Um, this one's uh, evolution of longitudinal division, multicellular bacteria, longitudinal, D division in multicellular bacteria of the Neisseriaceae family. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a bizarre paper because I never even thought this could happen, but I didn't like know these with rod yeah. bacteria. <laughs> we, we study that in you get like two types of back. Well, there are a couple of different types of bacteria, but two main shapes you learn about are are the circular ones, which we mm -hmm. call cocci, which is, is always fun when you're a freshman and you're learning that. <laughs> it's never not funny to call it cocci. Uh, and then you got rod shaped bacteria, which you would expect to be called cocci, but it's called rod shaped. Um, <laughs> and they kind of extend out. So you so you get rod shaped bacteria, and when they grow, they kind of like split off into two by like getting longer, like, yeah, like chopping the, up spaghetti. Yeah, from the poles, right? Like <laughs> they split in the middle, and so you get two more, they get longer and longer, and then it gets cut in the middle, so you get two long bacteria. Um, but in this particular, I, and these are also on the human body of all things, right? These are like oral mouth bacteria that they're talking about. Um, so they're even not that like alien. <laughs> it's not that alien environment to find these objects. Uh, but they find that these bacteria are getting fatter <laughs> and then they get split down the middle. <laughs> and yeah, instead of getting longer, they get fatter. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, this like just a very different division plane than um, I knew about in the past. It's a, it's an interesting yeah. observation. Kind <laughs> of like it, 
like it's a difference between like say if I was a person growing up like a snake and then dividing into two. This one is like dividing right down the middle and splitting up to the side. Yeah, and there's like a there's a bun in like Chinese uh, <laughs> bakeries that like you get in a little tray, a little tray bun. Mm. That's what these guys look like. They're just little buns <laughs> in a row attached together. <clears throat> yeah, and they they find to the point where like the, the actual like cell uh, the cell walls are are like linked up together. Mm -hmm. So. Um, which makes they, sense because actual... I think in the pole to pole, like in in rod shaped bacteria, you can get like filamentous style, right, where the cell walls are attached. So like that's actually that's almost like yeah, if if this division plane could exist, then you can imagine yeah, like being a filamentous bacteria, but instead of being attached by your poles, you're attached by your sides. <laughs> yeah, and you get these structures that almost remind me of annelid worms, really, but they are multiple like bacteria. Totally. And, <laughs> yeah, you're you're right. They are very much like illustrative of that kind of uh, yeah filamentous division. format. Mm -hmm. So like, we've got another like set of videos where you can kind of see this division in action. So in like the top like right top left corner, you see like normal division. Uh, it's a much shorter video. Let's see if we can press play on that again. And then with other ones, you can see that. They divide a bit slower, but like expanding out from the sun. And I'll say we say normal just because like that's what we're used to seeing, but like we have no idea what's yeah, normative right. in nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I said, like this is like a mouth bacteria, so presumably like uh, if you were digging and doing some microscopy in your mouth, you may have come across this shape before and been like, yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> yeah, and so they wanted to delve into exactly what's going on here. So they do this interesting thing called like almost like a well, I think a virtual uh, not a virtual a se sorry they do some se sequential kind of oh god like the words are evading oh, me yeah uh, I don't know uh, what it is but it's I, like it to me what it what I what I got from this is that they have fluorescent versions of specific peptidoglycan precursors and so they're in real time sort of doing microscopy and looking at where those peptidoglycan precursors are being formed are being yeah so they add in like the blue one first and then they add in the green and the red and you can get an idea of which part of the peptidoglycan was created mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. um so with so they looked at one species which uh they i think uh, which uh was they found split from one pole mm -hmm. first so they so they i mean so they so filiformis like they it kind of divides like this from the top down to the bottom. Um, yeah, I think they call it like a the, guillotine. <laughs> yeah. The they, septum is guillotining the cell in half. <laughs> yeah, it's going straight down, yeah. down the middle. Which is uh, actually kind of different from what I understand of pole, pole division, where pole division, the it's elongating. The, the peptidoglycan is being made, right? But then it's a fission plane. So like it gets drawn together and it sort of like gets um it gets pinched off. Here like the peptidoglycan's yeah. playing like a really big role in like uh, dividing the space. <clears throat> yeah, I mean with other cells, I've got the impression that it was like almost drug, every side around along the plane was coming at the same mm -hmm. time. Whereas this one is if just one edge of the cell coming yep. straight yeah. down, <clears throat> uh, which which is not something that I've encountered mm -hmm. before. I'm gonna stop trying to say unusual and weird because again, you're right. I yeah. Don't know. Whether it's unusual or weird. It's unusual or weird for us, but like, yeah, we're just like uh, big old humans, like looking into this tiny world that we have no frame of reference for. <laughs> yeah, they look at a bunch of other species as well, and what we can find there is instead of having it one side, it's coming back from both mm -hmm. sides. Uh, so kind of indicating that that these that these are going from both sides at the same time. So like. Uh, Double guillotine? <laughs> I mean, oh no, it's like the Star Trek doors. <laughs> it's like space. It's spaceship yeah, you're doors. Right. <laughs> I'm now more frightened of those doors than ever before. <laughs> but these images are are like just fascinating. Um, and yeah, peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan is this um, sort of sugar and amino acid molecule that uh, forms around bacteria, and uh, it 
the study of it is quite fascinating because it's essentially like a single molecule that ensheaths everything. And these techniques and to image it and to see it um, really tell us a lot about what governs bacterial shape and the different ways that bacteria can modify the peptidoglycan for, for different reasons. So these tools are, are just like, they make fascinating, they're just beautiful images. Um, and they're really important to studying, um, yeah, like why bacteria are shaped in the way that they do and how do they grow and maintain that shape. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think they do a bit more work to try and like look at into the evolution of mm -hmm. this. Like, so how do the, so do these evolve from say round bacteria that, that around it being, that became long yes. through different means or do they arrive at, were they long bacteria that somehow switch Yeah, around? yeah, because the proteins um, that like govern these fission events, like they're known in the respect of rod and cocci groups. And so they can look at the relatedness of those specific division proteins to the, to these, I don't know what we're calling them, um, longitudinal, right? That's what the title says. Longitudinally dividing yeah. bacteria to see which they have relation to. And I think they, they're related to rods, these guys. <clears throat> yeah, they found they were related to rods, which Admittedly, when I first read it, it seemed a bit odd, like, oh, these rods hit your bacteria are evolved from rods. I'm like, how many generations did you look back <laughs> on? Um, but but it, it makes sense just to, like, eliminate that. It, what, they didn't come from the mm -hmm, round mm -hmm. bacteria. Um, so they did a couple of mutations, and what they found was the main thing that was happening was that it seemed these, if they did the same mutations in bacteria that were, norm, that were like, did that standard elongation, what happened was that it didn't switch axes, but what happened is that the middle bit, the bit that gets built up that to divide the cell becomes much, mm -hmm. much longer. So uh, effectively it turned these, these cells into kind of these weird square shapes, a mm -hmm. lot fatter. And so the theory goes is that a long time ago, these the fact that kind of changed the axes of the whole cell rather than the, the division area within the cell. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say about that. It's really cool. I did not know that this shape existed. I'm so glad you found it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it was, I did not know that this existed either. So that was, inst <laughs> and that, so I'm betting on like people at home not knowing it either. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the more you know. Do -do -do. <laughs> uh, all right. And so we're ready to move on. The final paper that we have for you guys today is um, sort of a microbiome paper, wildfire dependent changes in soil microbiome diversity and function. Right, yeah. Um, so this is interesting because because wildfires, they are a big a big deal. Um, uh, they Because when a wildfire happens, a lot of changes happen to the environment. Firstly, you get, stuff gets burned up. And what happens when stuff gets burned up? You get lots of like carbon being changed into different things. So uh, you get think like, aromatics like so ring shaped molecules that maybe are hard to suggest you get lots of like bacteria dying off uh and you can, and the entire kind of ecology changes so this paper kind of looks at wildfire dependent changes in the soil microbiome diversity and function so they look at kind of everything to see what see how the microbiology how the microbiome is reacting to a forest fire mm-hmm yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? Microbiomes are always in dialogue with their environments and a forest fire changes soil chemistry in so many ways. It's like destroy, it's it's burning things up and it's depositing that stuff in the soil. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm not surprised <laughs> of this, but again, what's nice is that they have these um, da data sets now so that you can get a sense of what is growing in those areas and start to build hypotheses on how that um, how that impacts the sort of the changing ecosystem of that area. <clears throat> yeah, so a key thing to take away, what, what's the best bacteria to, to survive a fire? Well, first it has to be able to form spores. Mm. Uh, spores is a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a way to dry out so that they don't boil alive when the fire happens. <laughs> it's also great if you're deep in the soil, because the deeper you get in the soil, depending on how dry it is, the more likely you are to survive. Mm -hmm. um, also being able to grow fast, so take advantage of the fact that you got all these dead bacteria that when they die, they pop and lose all their nutrients. Yes. So if you're able to like kind of grow very fast, you can take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then, you, uh, then you've got the problem because the nutrients you get in a but in soil that's burned are quite different than the, the soil that is normally around because you're going to get a lot more kind of stuff that's a lot more like charcoal or a lot like more 
a lot harder to digest. So they there are like various, I think, uh, what we call, I think, cross-feeding species, well, species yes. that find ways to break down these uh, co complex carbons that are created during the wildfire, but in a way to, they have to collaborate with each other in order to do it. Um, and you get fungi that can do it all in one. It's because fungi are great. Um, <laughs> well, they, they also, they're usually, they have like a lot more complex metabolism. They don't do, yeah, back, where bacteria might rely on a lot of cross-feeding, fungi may be able to do it by themselves. <clears throat> yeah. So they, there's also, sort of like aromatic oh, carbons that are left after a fire that can be broken down by, uh, by the right kind of bacteria. Yeah. Also, uh, I was going to say the is... fungi part. Oh, I was just going to say with the fungi part, that's also like, remember we talked about like fungi being like the, the, the size scale that can sort of span mm. larger sizes so that you can get really tiny bacteria get, can be like moved on, on fungal hyphae or like uh, be able to travel along the water film on fungi hyphae in order to get uh, into the environment uh, up from maybe the deeper soils into those places where they have the opportunity to make use of those nutrients. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, there are other things that we need that happen as well. Like, so for instance, nitrogen fixing bacteria do not survive wildfires so, so well, mm. which is bad because wildfires are becoming much more common and we need nitrogen fixing bacteria to, for the soil community, uh, mm -hmm. mostly producing nitrogen, which is really important. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I thought this was like an interesting paper to bring that up to to people's attention because wildfires are becoming more common and it's important to understand how to help the soils recover after a wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also what what that means, right? When you're saying like wildfires happening more common, like it, yeah, it does mean that we're gonna see shifts in in microbiology, and so that's um, yeah, I don't know. That's it's important to know the full story, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that brings us to the end yeah. uh, of that. Um, Absolutely. Uh, join us in two weeks where we're going to cover cool, more uh, more cool microbiology news. If there is something that you want us to talk about, and like you have some interesting papers, I think we saw I saw a minimal that you had one on Twitter about uh, ORF three, a preprint about ORF three on our SARS-CoV two. So we'll mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, take a gander at that. If you guys have polio ones you want, just tweet us or let us know. <clears throat> yeah, I think there is a lot of interest in in the polio ones. So uh, definitely going to try and do a search to see what we can find. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, let, let's see what we, we can do. But uh, thank you very much for, for joining me to, today. Uh, we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or comments or corrections, please let us know in the comments. Yep, I totally agree. You can reach out to us, as I said, uh, with your uh, suggestions. We both believe that peer review is a process and that um, folks, if you've had a good time reading the papers, uh, then please let us know and uh, continue to join us. We're really happy to have you here. Um, if you have something uh, to add or found something unclear, just let us know in the comments. <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. <laughs> Same here, Faz. Tune in next week for more microbiology content. Goodbye. Two weeks, two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, yeah, two <laughs> weeks. Join us two weeks. Rewatch some of our old videos next week. Um, <laughs> see you in two weeks. Uh, uh, bye. Bye.